Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me here today. We're going to talk about breast cancer. Um, you know, I tried to consolidate the whole of breast cancer into this talk, so it's kind of a lot of talking. So just bear with me, and please feel free to interrupt and ask me any questions if, you, if you're not following or if you feel like um, you, ha you need additional information than what's on these slides. Um, so the objectives of my talk today, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about epidemiology of breast cancer. We'll go over the screening recommendations put forth by the different societies. Um, we'll talk about risk reduction strategies, um, a little bit about DCIS, and as far as invasive breast cancer goes, we'll talk about the staging, uh, treatment, surveillance, and survivorship. So globally, breast cancer is a pretty big problem. It's the most common cancer diagnosed in women um, all across the world, and it's the leading cause of cancer death in women um, worldwide. In the United States, uh, it's still the most common uh, cause of cancer in women, but the second leading cause of cancer death in women, the first being lung cancer. Most of the breast cancers lately are diagnosed because of screening mammograms, and about a third of these are uh, DCIS, or pre-invasive breast cancers. So if you look at the slide here, um, if you follow the incidence across uh, uh, the past several years, you note that there is an increase in uh, the breast cancer incidence in the late 80s and the early 90s, and this is attributable to the increased um, use of screening mammograms in this period. And in the early 2000s, you see that there's a drop in the breast cancer incidence. And this drop is attributed to the decreased use of hormone replacement therapy after the Women's Health Initiative study was resulted in the early 2000s, and people realized that hormone uh, replacement therapy wasn't any good, uh, and it was only increasing the risk of breast cancer, uh, cardiovascular disease, and all other things um, which came with it. So that drop in incidence is because of that, and, then st and now there's still a little bit of an increase in incidence. Um, but if you look at the mortality, though, there's a steady decline in mortality over the years. Um, and this is good. The, the five-year survival rates have also been steadily improving, and now it's well about 90 percent. Um, and this can be attributed uh, to a combination of things. One is uh, screening mammograms. Again, uh, when you do mammograms, you detect breast cancers at an earlier stage. And whenever you're detecting breast cancers at an earlier stage, it's, it's much, they're much more curable. Um, also, we've come a long way, not only in local regional treatment. Previously, the treatment was uh, a radical mastectomy. We don't do that anymore. Um, and we've also come a long way in terms of systemic treatments, and both in terms of chemotherapy as well as adjuvant uh, endocrine therapy. We've made a lot of progress, and it's a combination of these things which is reflected in the decreased mortality that you see. I did put this slide on here because it's interesting that the incidence of breast cancer is higher in the Caucasian population when compared to the African-American population, but if you look at the mortality, it's the other way around. The mortality is higher in the African-American population compared to the Caucasian population. And this can be explained by a few things, although not entirely. One, one of them is, again, screening mammograms is higher in the, pop, uh, in the Caucasian population compared to the African-Americans. Um, but also biologically, the tumors in African Americans uh, tend to be more aggressive, tend to present at a more advanced stage, and uh, somewhat chemo refractory sometimes. So I think it's a combination of things which we don't entirely know at this time uh, as to why this is. Um, this is another good uh, slide to keep in mind. Um, so this tells us about the age distribution of breast cancer, and if you look at the 45 to 54, just pay attention to that part, 54-year-old uh, age group, the incidence of breast cancer is about 21.6% of new cases happen in this age group. Um, and, and, and moving on, it's pretty much like 20s for the rest of the age groups too. But there is a decent amount of breast cancer happening even in women between 45 to 55. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of stressing on that because when we go on and talk about the screening recommendations, we'll see what um, the U.S. Preventative, Preventative Task Force screening recommendations and what the American Cancer Society's recommendations are and how they differ. Um, and overall, there's about 230,000 women uh, diagnosed uh, with breast cancer in the year of 2015, and of them, 40,000 women died of breast cancer. So uh, let's move on and speak a little bit about the risk factors uh, which contribute to breast, fa uh, breast cancer. Um, I would uh, classify them as non-modifiable and modifiable risk factor. 
So just being born as a woman is good enough uh, to have breast cancer. About one in eight women develop breast cancer in their lifetime in the United States. Um, and as you age, going from menarche to menopause, the risk of breast cancer increases by about 8.5% every year. And after menopause, there's a slight decline in uh, risk. Um, it drops to about 2.5%. Uh, personal and family history is a risk factor. Patients who have a family history of breast cancer are at a somewhat higher risk than patients who do not have a family history of breast cancer. And personal history of breast cancer, women who have had a breast cancer once uh, are about four to five times at a higher risk of developing another breast cancer in their lifetime. Um, reproductive history, um, pa women who uh, have their first childbirth less than 30 years um, have a lesser uh, incidence of breast cancer as compared to women whose first childbirth is after 30 years. Radiation, um, ionizing radiation to the chest wall, and this used to be done for the treatment of Hodgkin's lymphoma back in the day. Uh, women who received radiation uh, in their, uh, between 10 to 30 years of age, um, which is when the breast cancer was, the breast was in the formative uh, stages, these women have a significantly higher risk of breast cancer compared to the average population. Um, genetic factors such as BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation and other uh, mutations, which we'll talk a little bit more about these hereditary uh, breast cancer later on in this presentation. And menstrual history, women who have early menarche starting 12 or before and late menopause um, after uh, 50, these women tend to have a higher risk of breast cancer and race, um, as we talked about earlier, Caucasian population has a higher incidence of breast cancer. So the modifiable risk factors. Obesity is a known risk factor, especially for postmenopausal women. The data on obesity in premenopausal women is kind of not very clear. Uh, there are some studies which go to say that obesity may not be a risk factor, and actually obese women tend to have a lesser incidence of breast cancer, but it's not entirely clear. But certainly in postmenopausal women, obesity is a risk factor for breast cancer. Nulliparity is a, bre uh, a risk factor. Um, Breastfeeding for about a year and a half to two years in some studies has shown to be protective. Alcohol consumption, compared to women who do not drink at all, women who drink about two to five drinks per day are um, thought to be at a higher risk for breast cancer. Hormone replacement therapy is a certain risk factor. Um, oral contraceptive pills, uh, the risk is not very high, but there's, there's definitely a mild increase in risk. Um, exercise is thought to be protective. So, so let's talk a little bit about hereditary breast cancer. Um, only about 5 to 10% of all breast cancer cases are uh, hereditary. And of these, the BRCA1 and 2 mutations only account for 15% of the cases. We don't know about 50, what causes about 50% of the hereditary breast cancers. And the others are caused by single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, and some other high penetrance genes also uh, account for about 3 to 4% of the hereditary breast cancers. So um, the BRCA1 and the BRCA2 mutations, um, these are germline mutations, and they, um, they, these genes have high penetrance, and they tend to show up in multiple um, uh, first and second degree relatives if there's a particular family which is affected with these mutations. Lee Romney syndrome is also another high penetrance mutation in the TP53 uh, gene. And uh, there, this is a syndrome which is associated with not only breast cancer, but there are other cancers, uh, such as sarcomas, um, adenocortical car uh, carcinomas, leukemias, and brain tumors. Um, so if, if you're seeing a family with these cancers, or if you're seeing an individual who's had a sarcoma and has developed uh, breast cancer like pretty early on in their life, you definitely want to suspect these. And all, lately, uh, you know, if you, if you have a high suspicion for genetic um, uh, mutations and you send them for uh, genetic referral counseling and testing, they actually do a multi-panel testing where they look for multiple of these genes at one go. And if an individual has any of these, that will be detected. The Cowden syndrome is a mutation in the P10 gene, and this is also a pretty high penetrance gene. So what is the risk of an individual developing breast cancer or ovarian cancer if they have BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation? Um, so several different studies have been done. We've known about these mutations for about 20 years or more now. And um, if you look at various studies, the incidence is kind of all across the place, ranging 
for BRCA1, uh, the, the risk of breast cancer is anywhere from 55 to 70 percent uh, by the age of 70, and the risk of ovarian cancer is at about 40 percent. For BRCA2, it's a little lower. Uh, it's 45 to 70 percent, and for ovarian, it's 15. Um, and the risk of contralateral breast cancer with either of these is noted to be as high as 60 percent. Now, um, the, the difference in these numbers uh, is because if you look at different studies, uh, each of these studies has look, looked at different populations. Some of them had pre-selected populations, like Ashkenazi Jews. They have a higher risk of having BRCA mutations, and, um, and there are other risk factors which play into this, and that's why you cannot give an individual with a BRCA mutation an exact number of, like, say, your risk of having breast cancer is so much. No, you can never say that. You're just going to give them a, a broad range and say, you know, based on the other risk factors that you have, this is probably what um, your risk is. But all said and done, that's pretty high risk, right? 55 to 70 percent, that's really high risk of having breast cancer and ovarian cancer of 40 percent. Um, there are other uh, cancers that are associated with the BRCA1 and 2 mutations. For BRCA2 mutation, there's increased risk of breast cancer, male breast cancer, and prostate cancer. And there are other cancers associated with these, such as pancreatic cancer, fallopian tube carcinoma, and primary peritoneal carcinoma. So that brings us to who should be tested for these mutations. Um, you know, there's a long list of who should be tested, but in general, the way I look at it is if you're seeing women develop breast cancer in their younger age, at a younger age, like say they're, they're women who are having breast cancer in their 40s or uh, early 50s and women who are having multiple family members affected by breast or ovarian cancer, that's the person whom I would refer for uh, genetics. Um, or if you're seeing a woman who has like multiple family members, she herself does not have breast cancer, but say there's ovarian cancer in her cousin, there's breast cancer in her sister, someone else has breast cancer, a second degree relative has ovarian cancer, she would be someone who, whom I would send for genetics um, for testing and counseling. So the list of uh, who should be referred goes as two first-degree relatives with breast cancer and one at 50 or younger, three or more first- or second-degree relatives with breast cancer, a combination of breast and ovarian cancer among the first- and second-degree relatives, first-degree relative with bilateral breast cancer. So it's not common to have bilateral breast cancer, right? So if you're seeing this, then you probably want to be, you should be suspicious about an inherited cause or a, a genetic cause for breast cancer. Two or more first and second degree relatives with ovarian cancer, a male relative with breast cancer, and Ashkenazi Jewish descent uh, with any first degree relative or two second degree relatives on the same side of the family. Now, I do want to mention that when they did studies looking at the, Ash the, the Ashkenazi Jewish population, um, when they did referral just based on this criteria of like any first degree relative or two second degree relatives, I think they, they sort of underestimated the, um, the risk of these having BRCA, them having BRCA1-2 mutations. So some people say you really want to send all of them, but as, as of now, the guidelines don't want every Ashkenazi Jewish person to be tested for BRCA. It's only based on their family history. Um, so patients who have a personal history of breast cancer, uh, those who have been diagnosed at age 45 or less should be sent to genetics. Those who have had two or more breast primaries, and one of them should be at or before the age of 50. Age 50 or younger with one or more relatives with breast pancreatic or prostate cancer. Triple negative cancer with, uh, in, in, in someone who, who's less than 60. Now, this is important. Most of the BRCA, uh, most of the BRCA-related cancers have, happen to be triple negative uh, cancers. So if you're seeing a woman who's less than 60 years old and she has a triple negative cancer, do think about BRCA mutation. Uh, analysis. Uh, if there's one or more close relatives with breast cancer who are less than 50, two or more close relatives with breast cancer, one or more relative with ovarian cancer, and two or more relatives with pancreatic or prostate cancer. That's a little hard to remember, the whole list of things, but in, like I said, in general, if you're seeing multiple family members with BRCA-related cancers and young age of cancer, um, like in the 40s or early 50s, and if it's triple negative cancer, start thinking about uh, uh, genetic testing. So, so what, what do you do with that information? Yes, someone's BRCA mutation positive, so you know that these people are at high risk for uh, breast cancer and their lifetime risk is anywhere from like 45 to 70 percent. So what would you do? Um, you know, you would recommend prophylactic bilateral mastectomy. 
Um, this rec- decreases the risk of um, having breast cancer by greater than 90%. And prophylactic salping ophorectomy decreases the risk of ovarian cancer by greater than 95%. And in premenopausal women, it also decreases the risk of having breast cancer by 50%. Um, as far as chemo prevention goes, um, there's limited data, and there's kind of mixed data on chemo prevention. There was one positive study, and there's a few negative studies on chemo prevention. So whether or not these people benefit from tamoxifen is not a well-known uh, fact. But, you know, if the woman does not want to undergo a bilateral mastectomy and they do not want to undergo salping ophorectomy, um, they don't want to pra- do the other two risk reduction strategies, then, you know, we're left with nothing else but give them tamoxifen and hope for the best and obviously increased screening. Um, So I I put this slide about benign breast lesions here because I'm going to talk about chemo prevention next, and I think uh, it's important to recognize what kind of breast lesions pose an increased risk of breast cancer in the future. Um, The lesions which which do not increase the risk of breast cancer at all are uh, breast cysts, ductal ectasia, fibroadenoma, mastitis, and fibrosis. A, a, a small increase in risk of breast cancer is associated with papilloma and sclerosing adenosis and radial scar. And um, for the most part, we tend to go on and excise these lesions and do nothing after. We just kind of do the regular screening. Um, and the other lesions, which are definitely associated with increased risk of breast cancer and which would qualify for chemo prevention, are the atypical ductal hyperplasia and atypical lobular hyperplasia. Um, so you, you know, the, if you if you do have atypical ductal hyperplasia and atypical lobular hyperplasia um, on the pathology report from a biopsy, the next step would be to obviously excise these. You know, I did put DCIS and LCIS on here, but I don't know if I could truly call them benign lesions. They are more of like the precancerous or pre-malignant lesions. Uh, but then I just put them on there to give a perspective about who are the candidates who would be eligible for um, chemo prevention. Um, so what is chemo prevention? Um, ha- has anyone of you thought about chemo prevention in your clinics, in your primary care clinics? You know, when you saw a woman, you felt like she's high risk for breast cancer for some reason. Is that something you think about or probably not? Yeah, I don't think I did that as a resident either. So, uh, I, but I thought it was interesting because most of these women probably are going to um, see you in your primary care physician offices, and you know, and they would be, they would probably qualify for pre- chemo prevention, and there's pretty good data for it. So, um, who are the women who would be eligible? So, any of these high-risk breast lesions, which I mentioned earlier, with a relative risk of three to five, t- three to five. Uh, that is atypical ductal and atypical lobular hyperplasia. Now, DCIS, LCIS, of course, um, and women who. Uh, have a gale uh, risk of greater than 1.66. Have you heard of the gale risk before or the, the gale calculator before? How many of you know about that? Okay. Um, so, the, so this is an NCI tool which we have online, and, and all of you can access this. And uh, you put in information uh, pertaining to the woman's age, um, age of menarche, the family history, any history of uh, atypical ductal hyperplasia. Now, once you put in all this information, it gives you a particular score, and any woman who has a score of 1.66 or higher is thought to be at a, a high enough risk that she would benefit from chemo prevention. Um, I do have to say the Gale risk, uh, the, the, the Gale model works good at a population level, but it tends to underestimate the risk in women who have a significant history of family history of breast cancer. And there are a few other uh, models to calculate the um, risk for women, like the BRCA Pro and others, but then those are a little more complicated, and I'm not going to uh, go into the details of that in my talk today. Um, but in the two biggest trials, the NSABPP1 and the STAR trials, they kind of use these criteria to select women for chemo prevention. And the agents which are used for chemo prevention are tamoxifen, it's 20 milligrams daily for a total of five years, and raloxifene, 60 milligrams daily for a total of five years. I did put eczemastain and anastrozole down here. Um, these are not FDA approved, so I don't think you will be tested on your boards about these. But the only reason I put them here is there is data, and the NCCN guidelines do recommend using eczemastain and anastrozole only in postmenopausal women for uh, chemo prevention if you need to, if there's a contraindication for tamoxifen. So the trials which looked at uh, chemo prevention uh, is the NSAVP P1 trial. 
Um, this looked at tamoxifen versus placebo for five years uh, in women who were greater than 60 or with a Gale uh, score of 1.66 or higher. And uh, they saw a significant reduction in the breast cancer risk of 49%. So that's a pretty remarkable number, right? Um, and another trial which was done to look at chemo prevention was raloxifene. And they compared raloxifene to tamoxifen. Now, the first um, analysis which they put out after 3.9 years of follow-up, um, the, there was no difference between tamoxifen and raloxifene, either in the non-invasive or the invasive breast cancer. However, there was a 10-year follow-up which came out later on, and the tamoxifen was significantly better compared to raloxifene. Raloxifene was only about 80% as effective as tamoxifen in chemo prevention. Now, why, did, why do you even think of raloxifene? Because tamoxifen comes with certain side effects, which are uh, important to remember, and these may be contraindications for patients who would otherwise be eligible for chemo prevention, and those are um, increased risk of DVT and PE. You know, there's uh, mixed data about increased risk of stroke, but then in a woman who's had a stroke before, I probably would not use tamoxifen. Um, there's increased risk of uterine cancer. The incidence is not terribly high, um, and it's usually seen in women greater than 55 years of age, but that's something to keep in mind. So, but then raloxifene has a better side effect profile in the sense the VT and the uterine cancer risk are, risks are much lower. Um, so that's why raloxifene was even looked at. And this is the, um, this is the data which shows that raloxifene is definitely uh, inferior to tamoxifen in preventing uh, invasive breast cancer. And this is a 10-year follow-up, which was published in 2010. So um, do you all have any questions about chemo prevention? I, I did want to bring this up and just want to clarify, you know, because I think we see a lot of women who would otherwise qualify for chemo prevention in your clinics if you go by their family history and other stuff. But I, I, I almost felt like we never, ever did chemo prevention in our clinics. Or, you know, if you don't feel comfortable, even referring the patient to an oncologist would be important, I think. Um, so let's move on to screening. Um, you know, there's recent um, USPSTF recommendations on screening, um, and also ACS has changed some of their recommendations. So uh, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, rec Task Force recommends that uh, women should start screening at the age of 50, and this should go on to the age of 74. And it's not every year, but it's every other year. Um, and this is a B recommendation. So I do want to just uh, tell you what the, um, the ABC recommendations mean uh, for the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. Uh, basically, all of these are positive recommendations. It's only that A would be the strong data, B is moderate, and C is small, but still positive recommendation. D is against doing something, uh, and I is just insufficient data to say one way or the other. So uh, the, the next recommendation is if a woman wants to start screening mammograms at 40, then that would be an individual decision. It's not something you would say you have to do, but then you would start the discussion at the age of 40, and you talk to the woman about risks and benefits, about um, you know, what's, what are the pros of doing screening mammograms, and you know, what, you know, why would you want to do screening mammograms, or what, what are the risks. You, know, you would talk to her about the overdiagnosis, um, and um, the false positive rate, and things like that. And then it would be a shared decision between you and your patient whether or not she wants to start screening at 40. Right now, there's insufficient evidence to assess balance of benefits and harms of screening in women who are 75 years and older. That's because the studies which looked at screening mammograms, there were about eight randomized trials, and uh, most of these trials did not include patients above 75 years. So we don't have enough data to say one way or the other. The American Cancer Society recommendations are um, women aged between 40 to 44 should have the choice to start annual screening mammograms. 45 to 54, they recommend annual mammograms, and 55 or older, they should switch to mammograms every two years, or they should have the choice to continue annual screening. So you see the difference between both of these, right? One asks you to start 50, the other starts at 45, one is every other year, one is annually. Um, so I think in my practice, I would probably start at 45, and I, and I kind of agree with the American Cancer Society. 
to do screening mammograms annually between 45 to 54 and then move on to biennial um, every other year. And, and that's because pe women who tend to have breast cancer in their 40s usually tend to have more aggressive breast cancers, which are faster growing. And if I would go two years without not uh, picking up on this cancer, I'm not sure if I'm very comfortable with that. Correct me if I'm wrong, but if mammograms have an exactly uh, properly by the aggressive cancers in that baby population. Mammograms don't pick up the aggressive. the aggressive. That's right. That's what they say, that the interval cancers are not usually picked up. But there are quite a few times that I've seen, and I think it's just from my own personal experience, and I think that's for my own practice. I don't know if there's any great data to support that. I would feel more comfortable doing annual mammograms between 45 and 54. Um, most of the aggressive cancers are, you're right, they are interval cancers, so they would show up in between the two mammograms. Uh, but then going back to the initial epidemiology slide, which I had shown, if you remember, the incidence of breast cancer in women between, uh, the, the percentage of women, breast cancer in women between 45 to 54 is still about 21%, and that's only about like 5% lower than between 55 and 64. So it's not that much different. However, um, when the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force analyzed their data, they looked at randomized control trials and they looked at observational trials. Uh, the, the randomized control trials kind of um, did not show a huge benefit starting at this age or doing it every year. Whereas if you look at the observational data, it, they definitely show a benefit in starting early. And I don't know why the difference is. You know, observational data is always observational data. You cannot go by it. But, but the thing about the randomized controlled trials, I think, um, is these are all older trials except one trial. I think that's the AGE trial, which is a more recent trial. The rest of them are pretty older. And when you're looking at the older trials, you, are, you also have to take into account about the techniques. You know, the techniques of mammogram have evolved over time. I don't know if it has taken into account this. Because, you know, women in their 40s tend to have dense breasts. And I don't know what percentage of women um, in these older trials were actually picked up because of their dense press and not that good technique, whereas now we have better techniques and you know, more refined techniques to pick up women um, in this age group who have breast cancer. So I don't know if some of it is because of that. You know, there's a lot of controversy, but I think as far as your boards go, I think you should just, uh, I, I don't think you all follow the ACS. I think in primary care, they would go by the preventive task force recommendation, right? Okay. Well, I hope I answered your question. Yes, no, thank you. Um, so what about a clinical breast exam? So American Cancer Society recommends not performing a clinical breast exam. U.S. Preventative Service Task Force says insuffic insufficient evidence for, uh, for any added benefits. So essentially, both of them are saying you don't really have to do a clinical breast exam in your patients. Whereas the uh, American, I think it's ACOG, the Obstetrics and Gynecology uh, Society, they say they, they want to do a clinical exam every one to three years. Um, and again, all these societies recommended against self-breast examination. Women with breast cancer who have been diagnosed with breast cancer, though, as a part of their surveillance, we talk about breast awareness just so that they're aware of how their breast is changing. And if there's a new mass which comes up, we would say, okay, well, just bring it to our attention. But that's not the same as a self-breast exam or a clinical breast exam. Now, uh, breast MRI... The ACS uh, recommends annual MRI in addition to mammograms in patients who are BRCA mutation carriers and those who have a lifetime risk of breast cancer of greater than 20% and those who have had radiation to chest wall between 10 and 30 years and uh, those with Lee-Fromini and Cowden syndrome. So... You mean like people that have... Uh, I, don't know, I can't remember how they like comment, but it's like nodular breast tissue like high dense, like the dense breasts. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of controversy about what we should, should do with the dense breasted uh, patients. Sometimes the radiologist does recommend doing an MRI and we kind of follow that. But then the data on doing an, an MRI regularly on these patients is not strong. So we don't really do it. So we really only stick to annual mammograms right now unless the radiologist mentions that, you know, there's something suspicious in their uh, breasts and, you know, the recommendation is for an annual MRI. Then we would alternate the mammogram with an MRI uh, every six months. Yeah, but I don't think there's any uh, data to support doing a regular MRI on these patients. So moving on to diagnosis of breast cancer. Now, um, 
So some of these uh, breast cancers are detected on screening mammograms, but some of these patients present with a palpable mass. Either way, so you go on and do a diagnostic mammogram with uh, additional pro pro projections and uh, spot compression views. And uh, you would, on the diagnostic mammogram, what you would see is either a speculated mass, which, uh, you know, which is very um, characteristic of an invasive carcinoma, or you could see microcalcifications. Now, microcalcifications could be associated with invasive tumor, or they could be associated with DCIS, or they may be nothing. So just based on the mammographic findings alone, you won't be able to say, but then the radiologist gives you um, what's called the BIRADS score, which goes from zero to six, zero meaning insufficient data, and one to three is sort of more on the benign side, and four to six is more on the malignant side. And, um, and they give you guidelines for additional workup, you know, whether this person needs um, you know, ultrasound or uh, if they feel that this tumor is not well visualized on the mammogram, you know, if there's a discrepancy between the physical exam and what the tumor looks like on the mammogram, they may say, let's get an MRI. Um, so the first step, though, is doing a diagnostic mammogram. And then uh, ultrasound is not needed in all, but I have to say here, in our practice, I think pretty much everyone who's diagnosed with um, a breast cancer on a diagnostic mammogram gets an ultrasound, uh, more so because you, you have to look, evaluate the axilla. Even if the axilla is clinically negative, you want to go on and do an ultrasound and make sure there's no axillary lymphadenopathy. That's one reason. And the other reason is to do a biopsy. An ultrasound, an ultrasound guided biopsy is what we um, do for the most part um, in women. So, so you do an ultrasound, but then the ultrasound real recommendations are for palpable masses with a negative mammogram in women uh, who are less than 30 years of age because in these women, their uh, breast density is pretty high and mammogram is not reliable at all. Um, and again, biopsy of the suspicion, suspicious lesions and evaluation of the axilla. Now, what about an MRI? MRI has great sensitivity, like in the high 90s, but um, the specificity is terrible. It's like in the 40s. So in someone who has a high pretest probability, you know, someone who has a mass and you know that this is most likely cancer, you do an MRI, that's reasonable. But you would definitely not do MRI on everyone whom you're suspicious of uh, having a cancer. Um, it's helpful to assess the extent of the disease. Um, you know, if you do a mammogram and you're seeing a mass which pants from, say, the nipple all the way across the chest and going to your chest wall, and you're, you're not able to delineate the extent of the disease, and that's important for the surgeon to plan his technique, you, you, at that time, an MRI is reasonable to see what the extent of the disease is. And some tumors are mammographically occult. You're doing a physical exam, and your tumor measures like five centimeters, but you do a mammogram, and you know, you're seeing like a one or two centimeter tumor. Some, sometimes that'll be helpful, and that's, um, that's more the case with lobular carcinomas. They tend to be uh, mammographically occult, so MRI sometimes t tends to be helpful, but not always. Um, then to, to assess the amount of axillary nodal metastasis when there's an occult uh, primary, you know, when someone presents with a lymph node in the axilla and you do a mammogram and you don't see anything on the mammogram, that's a definite indication for uh, an MRI. And I think I saw a mix-up question in, uh, where they kind of ask about this. So um, that's something you may be tested on. Um, people who have dense breasts, again, that's, that's a soft indication, and uh, it's really, um, it depends. It's a case-by-case. Case. Uh, women who are at high risk for contralateral disease, such as BRCA mutation carriers, um, they do need an MRI. Um, the next step would be to biopsy this uh, suspicious mass and um, look at the pathology. Uh, so for the most part, you're doing an image-guided core needle biopsy. You know, uh, and, if, and if you have a core needle biopsy of the primary mass, it's acceptable to just do an FNA of the axillary lymph nodes. Uh, the problem by, of doing an FNA on the primary mass is that you may not have enough material to do all the immunohistochemistry uh, studies, so therefore a core biopsy is always um, ideal. Um, sometimes the radiologist may go in and do a wire localization and place a clip uh, for the surgeon to identify this uh, at the time of excision, especially if it's a small mass that makes it easy for breast conservation therapy. Um, and the next step is pathological assessment of this tumor. And when you're uh, doing the pathological assessment, um, there's a few things you would focus on. That would be um, most of, mostly the prognostic factors, that is what, what the morphology of the tumor is, what is the grade of the tumor, uh, whether there's lymphovascular invasion or not, and what the hormone receptor status is, HER2 expression, and KI67. 
Um, so stage of the tumor is a prognostic factor. And then as far as staging of breast cancer goes, um, if you're seeing a patient who only has a breast mass and who does not have any axillary lymphadenopathy, lymphadenopathy for the most part, that patient is either a stage 1 or stage 2. And most stage 1 and stage 2 patients do not require a CT of the chest, abdomen, pelvis, or a bone scan for staging purposes. So just a, a good dedicated breast imaging and axillary imaging is good enough to stage these patients. Um, and tumor morphology, there's various morphologies. I'm not going to go into all the details because, um, for the most part, they're treated the same way except for mucinous cancers, which tend to be uh, of lower malignant potential and mostly um, hormone, po- uh, receptor, hormone receptor positive and treated most, uh, and the size... Um, and I don't think you'll be tested on that. Um, uh, for the most part, they're treated with endocrine therapy. Um, histological grade, that goes from 1 to 3, and um, the pathologist will give you a grade based on how the tumor looks, you know, what the mitotic rate is, what amount of necrosis is there, um, grade 1 being uh, the best and grade 3 being the worst. Uh, lymphovascular invasion, it's, it's kind of one step um, uh, behind, uh, short of lymph node metastasis. So if a tumor has lymphovascular invasion, I would be really careful about uh, looking at the lymph nodes and, you know, they have a high chance of having lymph node positive disease. Hormone receptor status, you look for estrogen receptor and progesterone receptors, and um, both of these are uh, done by um, immunohistochemistry. Um, and the hormone receptor status and the HER2 expression, both of these are important for your um, adjuvant therapy, systemic therapy, you know, uh, in giving, you, this helps you determine who benefits from endocrine therapy and who benefits from systemic chemotherapy and her to targeted agents. And KI67 is actually sort of a proliferative uh, rate, um, and the number goes from 1 to 100, and less than 15, um, I, would, I would say these are low proliferative tumors, and greater than 15 is um, high, you know, it's, it's a higher proliferation rate. So before we move on and talk about invasive breast cancer, I do want to talk quickly about uh, DCIS. So in the normal breast tissue is made up of lobes and ducts, and most of the cancers uh, start in the ductal epithelium. Um, and usually there's a single uh, layer of epithelium uh, lining these ducts, and when there's abnormal proliferation of this ductal epithelium, uh, without invasion of the duct, that's when you call it DCIS. And about a third of the newly screen diagnosed cancers are um, DCIS. And they commonly are seen as microcalcifications on mammograms. Patients with DCIS do not typically present with a mass, but you know some of them may, uh, but it's uncommon. So how do you treat DCIS? Um, you treat it either with a lumpectomy or a mastectomy. Um, now, it depends on the extent of DCIS. If there's a small-breasted woman with a large uh, area of DCIS, then you may have to do a mastectomy. But most of them are pretty manageable with lumpectomy alone. And after the lumpectomy, you have to do radiation for local control. Um, an acceptable negative margin is 2 millimeters or greater. Now, after uh, the surgical management of DCIS, um, these tumors... If they are estrogen receptor positive, um, you know, you have to give them adjuvant endocrine therapy with either, um, you know, tamoxifen is the one which has been approved. Anastrozole has not been approved or any AI has not been approved in uh, women with DCIS. However, I have to say there was a recent uh, study, the NSAB PB35, which was just published last year, like late last year, where anastrozole was actually better than tamoxifen for patients with DCIS who are postmenopausal. So I, it may be approved soon. Um, tamoxifen also decreases the, it decreases the risk of ipsilateral and contralateral DCIS, but tamoxifen has no mortality benefits. So patients who receive adjuvant endocrine therapy after DCIS, there is absolutely no mortality benefit. It's only to prevent further invasive cancer. And that's important to discuss with your patient um, when, you're having, when you're recommending this treatment. So staging of breast cancer. Um, it's, it's, uh, we practice the TNM uh, staging. Now, this is a very simplified version of staging, um, which I just put this on here because I think this will be useful for your boards if you remember it this way. Um, stage 1, any tumor which has no lymph nodes will either be stage 1 or stage 2. So stage 1, the tumor is usually less than 2 centimeters. Stage 2, uh, if there's no lymph nodes but the tumor is greater than 2 centimeters, 
uh, when the tumor is less than two centimeters, but there's one to three lymph nodes involved, then that would be stage two. And the lymph nodes should not be matted. Um, but if you're having matted lymph nodes or more, four or more lymph nodes involved, it's going to be a stage three tumor. And any large tumor, which is greater than five centimeters, is going to be a stage three tumor. Um, T4, irrespective of the nodal involvement, is going to be stage 3. And uh, T4 tumors are the tumors which either in, invade your chest wall or the skin. You know, if there are multiple skin nodules, that would be a T4. And inflammatory breast cancer is always a T4 tumor. Uh, stage 4 tumors are the ones which present with distant metastasis. So how do you treat uh, breast cancer? So distant met- all the stage, I'm not going to talk about treatment for stage four today because that's going to be extensive, and then I don't think you'll be asked about it on your boards. Um, and pretty much all of the stage four tumors are managed only with systemic therapy, either endocrine or chemotherapy. Stage one to stage three, um, I would divide the management into local regional treatment and systemic treatment. So the local regional treatment is more for local control, and the systemic treatment is to prevent the recurrence of cancer and prevent distant metastasis. So uh, the, the primary surgical treatment could be either a lumpectomy or a mastectomy. That depends a lot on how big the tumor is and, um, the, you know, a lot of factors which the surgeon has to take into account. Um, you do have to do an axillary lymph node evaluation. In women who are clinically node positive on exam, like on ultrasound or physical exam, those women go on to have an axillary lymph node dissection. But women who are node negative on presentation you do have to do what's called a sentinel lymph node biopsy at the time of uh, lumpectomy or mastectomy to determine lymph nodal involvement. And if the sentinel lymph node biopsy comes back positive, you go on to do uh, uh, axillary lymph node dissection. Any patient who's treated with a lumpectomy needs to have radiation to the chest. Um, so, uh, as far as systemic treatment goes, um, it can be divided into neoadjuvant and adjuvant chemotherapy, endocrine therapy, and HER2 targeted therapy. Now, neoadjuvant chemotherapy is the chemotherapy which is given prior to surgery, and adjuvant chemotherapy is given after surgery. You know, lately we've also been doing neoadjuvant endocrine therapy, but I don't think you'll be asked about that on boards at all, so I'm not going to go into the details of that. And HER2 targeted therapy is usually given along with chemotherapy, so the chemotherapy is usually given for a period of three to six months, but the HER2 targeted therapy, even after completion of the chemotherapy, you continue it for a period of one year as maintenance. So uh, local regional treatments usually given for stage one and stage two cancers. Um, and breast conservation therapy, meaning lumpectomy, is preferred because there's no overall survival benefit or disease-specific survival benefit um, when you do a mastectomy as compared to a lumpectomy. There are some contraindications to lumpectomy, and the absolute contraindications are those women who have received high-dose radiation to the breast or the chest wall, uh, pregnancy, which could not be completed before uh, it's time for radiation, multifocal disease, and positive margins. Relative contraindications are connective tissue disease. Women who have connective tissue disease do poorly with radiation, so you try to avoid uh, radiation if possible in women who've, who have connective tissue disease. Um, and tumors which are greater than five centimeters, um, you know, it's hard, to, it's hard to give a good cosmetic outcome when you do a lumpectomy in women with such big tumors. And people who are genetically predisposed, such as BRCA1-2 mutations, who have a high risk of recurrent cancers or contralateral cancers, you much rather do a mastectomy than doing a lumpectomy. Um, breast conservation therapy is always followed by radiation. I've just put the slide up here um, to show you how the sentinel lymph node biopsy is performed. They basically inject uh, the site around the tumor with either like a blue dye or a radioactive material, and they trace uh, this dye to what lymph nodes it goes to first. And the lymph nodes that it goes to first is the sentinel lymph node, and they pick those lymph nodes out, biopsy them, do a frozen section, and if these come back positive, then they go on to do a uh, axillary lymph node dissection. Um, I think we pretty much, okay, yeah, the post-mastectomy radiation, usually a mas- uh, radiation is not needed after mastectomy. However, post-mastectomy radiation to chest wall and regional lymph node basin is required if there are four or more positive lymph nodes, if there's N3 disease. Um, N3 disease would be supraclavicular or infraclavicular disease or internal mammary along with axillary lymph node disease. That would be N3 disease. Uh, positive margins, and you would consider it in some patients um, who have one to three positive nodes and uh, T3 tumors, uh, and in patients who have closed margins, 
um, with adverse features such as lymphovascular invasion, uh, triple negative breast cancer, and in young patients. Now, I don't think that they're going to ask you about all this on your boards. I think it's just important to remember that people who have four or more lymph nodes or N3 disease is someone who's going to need radiation, even after a mastectomy. Now, systemic treatment. Uh, systemic treatment, uh, the, the goal of systemic treatment is to prevent uh, recurrences of the breast cancer and to prevent distant metastasis. And systemic treatment is, a, is either adjuvant endocrine treatment or adjuvant or neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, the need for systemic therapy depends upon what is the risk of recurrence of this particular cancer which is determined to a certain extent by all these prognostic features, which I mentioned here. And we also have some tools online, such as the adjuvant online. Are you all familiar with that, or have you ever? So um, adjuvant online is a tool where you put in kind of the characteristics of the tumor. You put in the size of the tumor, the lymph nodal status, and you know, the kind of chemotherapy you plan to give the patient. And it, ki gives, it comes up with this uh, uh, information about what is the percentage of uh, mortality benefit the patient's going to derive by giving chemotherapy or just giving adjuvant endocrine therapy alone. And it helps uh, you and your patient make an informed uh, decision about moving forwards with chemotherapy or not. Um, so for the purposes of chemotherapy, well, systemic therapy, I would divide breast cancer predominantly into four different types. The first type being... Uh, the tumor, which is estrogen receptor positive, progesterone receptor positive, but HER2 negative. And the way I would look at treatment is divide the tumor into less than 0.5 centimeters, that is T1A, or more than 0.5 centimeters, and lymph node positive. So a T1A tumor, which, does not, uh, which is not lymph node positive, never requires chemotherapy. So your treatment, your answer would always be endocrine therapy. A tumor which has four or more lymph nodes positive, the answer is always chemo plus um, endocrine therapy. And the sequence is you give chemotherapy first and then go on to give endocrine therapy for a period of five years. Now, the in-between tumors are tricky, and I'm hoping that they won't test you on this, and I don't think they will, because these tumors which are between T1B to T3 and lymph node negative, or those tumors which have one to three lymph node positive, uh, we do what's called Oncotype DX, which is basically a genetic uh, a test where we look at different genes which are expressed in this tumor and see what's overexpressed, and it gives us a score, and, and um, uh, what's called a recurrence score, and, tells, uh, and that score gives us information about who would or would not benefit from chemotherapy. So it's kind of a complex decision, I think, and I don't think you all would be tested on that, but it's just uh, good to know that you know, these, we don't give chemotherapy to all the patients who are lymph node positive um, and who are ERPR positive. Some of them you know, can, can just benefit from endocrine therapy alone. Uh, the next kind of uh, tumor type would be estrogen receptor negative, progesterone receptor negative, and HER2 positive. Now, HER2 um, overexpressing tumors uh, benefit from HER2 monoclonal antibodies. That, that's trastuzumab is, uh, is a particular um, monoclonal antibody which has been around for a long time, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with that. There's a newer uh, monoclonal antibody called pertuzumab, which, uh, again, I don't think you'll be asked about that, but the pertuzumab, pertuzumab is used only in tumors uh, in the new adjuvant setting. It has not been approved for the adjuvant setting. Um, tumors which are less than 0.5 centimeters and lymph node negative, they do not need any sort of adjuvant treatment. And since they are not ERPR uh, positive tumors, they don't benefit from endocrine therapy, so there's absolutely no adjuvant treatment for these tumors. Now, again, tumors which are T1B, that is 0.5 to 1 centimeter, but lymph node negative, it's very controversial, and it's a very physician and patient-dependent choice whether or not you want to give them chemotherapy because the benefit, like, like I said, the, the, risk, the benefit from chemotherapy depends on the risk of recurrence, and the risk of recurrence in these tumors is not that high. It's usually less than 10% or maybe at the most 15%. So the benefit you're going to derive from chemotherapy will be 5% or even less than that. So that's a decision uh, which will be made by the patient and the physician after they discuss um, all those factors. So I don't think they'll ask you about that. Now, T1C to T3, that is any tumor which is greater than one centimeter, or any tumor which is lymph node positive, you definitely give chemotherapy along with trastuzumab. Is that clear, it, or is it really over the board? Okay. All right. Um, now, systemic, in, in terms of tumors which are 
triple negative, that is estrogen receptor negative, progesterone receptor negative, and HER2 negative, tumors which are 0.5 centimeters or less, no chemo. Tumors which are lymph node positive, yes, definite chemo. Tumors which are 0.5 to 1 centimeter, controversial, so you probably won't be asked about that. Now, I do want to talk a little bit about endocrine therapy. Um, so endocrine therapy is indicated for all the hormone receptor positive tumors, for hormone receptor positive DCIS and hormone receptor positive invasive tumors. Uh, the endocrine uh, therapy definitely decreases the breast cancer recurrence as well as mortality in invasive breast cancers. And the agents which are used are tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors. Now, tamoxifen is a, a selective estrogen receptor modulator, so it uh, acts as an agonist at some estrogen receptors and acts as an antagonist at the others. On the breast tissue, it acts as an antagonist. It's approved for use in both premenopausal and postmenopausal women. However, the aromatase inhibitors can be used only in the postmenopausal women. Do not use them in the premenopausal women because they act as fertility agents and they may actually increase your risk of breast cancer. Um, so the duration of treatment uh, is five years, although there's more data now uh, where in certain cases um, we know that 10 years of endocrine therapy may be beneficial, but I don't think they'll ask you about that on your boards. So I would, for all practical purposes, stick to five years as the duration of treatment for that. Um, now, what, decide, what determines uh, which agent you're going to use would be obviously your menopausal status and the side effect profile of these agents is important to know when you're choosing um, between tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors for your patients. So the adverse effects of tamoxifen, uh, like I mentioned earlier, DVT and PE, and someone who's had a history of DVT and PE, you do not want to use tamoxifen. Uterine cancer, this is a bigger risk in patients who are above 55 years. Hot flashes, vaginal dryness, sexual dysfunction, and cataracts is another uh, side effect which I did not put on here, and uh, uh, retinopathy is another side effect with tamoxifen. Uh, the one important thing you, I, I want you all to remember is the drug interactions of tamoxifen with the CYP2D6 inhibitors, uh, which are most of the SSRIs. The you know, many of these patients uh, who've undergone treatment for breast cancer and, you know, and uh, after the treatment, they, they suffer from depression, anxiety, and they tend to be on a lot of these medications. And tamoxifen, um, it's, it's actually uh, metabolized to its, to its active uh, metabolite, the endoxifen, by the CYP2D6, and the inhibitors such as um, fluoxetine and paroxetine, they decrease the efficacy of tamoxifen, so you don't want your patients to be on those medications. Venlafaxine is a safe medication for them to be on. Citalopram is a CYP2D6 inhibitor, but it, it's, not, it's not that uh, big a CYP2D6 inhibitor, so we're kind of okay with people being on citalopram or escitalopram. So effects are citalopram, escitalopram are the three medications. I would say it's okay for patients on tamoxifen to be on, but not the others. The aromatase inhibitors, um, the way they work is by uh, decreasing the plasma estrogen level by inhibiting the aromatase. So in, in the premenopausal period, uh, the majority of estrogen in a woman comes from their ovaries. In the postmenopausal period, your estrogen is produced by your uh, adipose tissue, and aromatase plays a big role. And aromatase inhibitors, by blocking this enzyme, decrease the estrogen levels and thereby um, are beneficial for uh, women with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. There are three agents which are currently approved, anastrozole, letrozole, and eczemastain, and the efficacy as well as side effects are pretty much the same for all of these agents, so you can choose between uh, either of these three. But typically, we tend to start off with anastrozole or letrozole because there's data uh, to support use of eczemastain in patients who present with uh, metastatic uh, disease later on in combination with some other agents. So to, you would see most patients being started on anastrozole or letrozole. The adverse effects, about a third of the patients who are started on AIs um, experience um, musculoskeletal sim symptoms such as arthralgias, joint pains, joint stiffness. And there was one study which, uh, which actually shows that exercise is about the only thing which seems to be beneficial in preventing these side effects. Um, the AIs do decrease uh, bone mineral density. So whenever you're starting a postmenopausal woman on an AI, you want to get a DEXA scan at baseline, make sure there's no osteopenia or osteoporosis. And anyone who has a T-score of greater than minus 2, I usually tend to start them on bisphosphonate treatment alongside with an AI. And if they have clear-cut osteoporosis and if it's pretty bad, um, I would probably start off with tamoxifen, give that for two years, and switch to an AI at a later point when, when their bone mineral density is better. Um, they do increase risk of uh, uh, cardiovascular disease and uh, hypercholesterolemia, so that's something you want to pay attention to on their follow-up visits. 
Now, a little bit about chemotherapy. The common agents which are used are anthracycline, cyclophosphamide, uh, and tadzane. A combination of these is used. There are other agents which are used, but not so commonly. Uh, the common side effects of chemotherapy are nausea, vomiting, alopecia, myelosuppression, febrile neutropenia, and amenorrhea. Uh, the rare but the serious side effects, which you all need to remember, is leukemia and MDS. And this does not happen right away. This happens about 7 to 10 years after someone is treated with breast cancer. So I think that's important to just have at the back of your mind, because if you're seeing a patient like 7 or 10 years down the line and presents with some abnormal symptoms or abnormal labs, that's something you want to think about, because... Um, the risk of these is not very high. It's about 1% to 2%, but, but it's there. And it's more so with anthracyclines than, and cyclophosphamide than any other agents. The anthracyclines also cause a dose-dependent cardiotoxicity. Um, and taxanes, the main side effect of taxanes is peripheral neuropathy. Uh, uh, as far as trastuzumab and pertuzumab, these are the monoclonal antibodies uh, to the HER2 receptor uh, they're usually given along with other chemotherapeutic agents in the HER2 overexpressed breast cancer. They, when they're given as a single agent, they're not effective, so that's pretty much never done other than the maintenance setting. You always give it along with other chemotherapeutic agents. Um, the, and the trastuzumab treatment is continued uh, for a period of one year. They decrease the uh, breast cancer recurrence by 50% and uh, improve survival. The adverse effects are cardiotoxicity, and when someone's on trastuzumab, you want to do an echocardiogram every three months. The good thing, though, about the cardiotoxicity with this is it's a reversible thing when you stop this agent. A combination of trastuzumab and anthracycline has a 20% chance of um, uh, uh, causing a drop in the EF, so I would be careful when I'm using both these agents together. Pertuzumab, like I mentioned, is approved only in the neoadjuvant setting. So when do you use neoadjuvant chemotherapy? <coughs> Off late, the nation is moving towards using neoadjuvant and pretty much all, most of the people who require systemic chemotherapy because it's much more convenient. Patients tend to do much better when they get chemotherapy up front because after surgery there could be a delay in wound healing, something else, which could delay uh, their uh, you know, uh, getting chemotherapy. And it's important to give chemotherapy in the first six to eight weeks following surgery because if you delay the adjuvant chemotherapy, you know, that decreases the benefit of adjuvant chemotherapy. So if you, however, if you do it in the new adjuvant setting, though, you're getting it all done before surgery and there's no question about delay. But then there's certain definite indications, which I think you could be tested on your boards about. Uh, that's T4 disease. Whenever there's chest wall invasion or, uh, or whenever there's skin invasion, you want to treat these patients with new adjuvant chemotherapy. When there's extensive lymph nodal involvement uh, to decrease the disease burden and make the surgery better, you do want to use neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And inflammatory breast cancer is a definite indication for neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So let's talk a little bit about inflammatory breast cancer. So what is inflammatory breast cancer? It's, a, it's, it's an aggressive form of breast cancer which has rapid growth and lymph nodal involvement. And it can be of any type. It could be hormone receptor positive. It could be triple negative. It could be HER2 positive. But it's just that rapid growth of breast cancer, which causes dermal uh, lymphatic infiltration and causes some puckering of the skin and, and the characteristic appearance of that orange peel. And it's the, the diagnosis of inflammatory breast cancer is a clinical one. It's not something that you make on imaging. You need to have a biopsy-confirmed invasive ductal carcinoma or, uh, or invasive breast cancer um, and a clinical picture, uh, which looks like this, uh, to call it inflammatory breast cancer. I have to say, sometimes when patients presented with, present with neglected breasts, the skin may appear just like this. The difference, though, is neglected breasts, the tumor would have been present for several months or years. Inflammatory breast cancer, that's not the case. The tumor is typically progressing within a matter of days or weeks. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And all these treatments, all these patients definitely need treatment with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, there's no role for breast conservation in inflammatory breast cancer. It's always a mastectomy. Everyone needs an axillary lymph node dissection, and everyone needs post-mastectomy radiation, so they get it all. All right, moving on to surveillance, which I think is very important because I feel, I'm, you know, most of the times oncologists are going to see patients with breast cancer, treat them with chemotherapy, put them on endocrine therapy. I will see them for a year or two, and then... They'll, be move, they, they, they'll move on and see their primary care physicians. Now, different practices are different. I tend to see my patients all through, but then some, some practices may tend to roll them over to primary care physician, physicians. So I think it's important for you all to have an idea about what um, to do in terms of surveillance. 
So there is no role for any CT scans or chest X-rays or labs in surveillance of breast cancer patients. Um, the most important thing is history and physical examination, um, the, which you have to do in the first three years. The NCCN recommends a three to six monthly follow-up, and, and, in the, and the next two years, it's every six to 12 months. And each of these visits, you definitely want to ask your patients about symptoms of metastatic disease, um, as well as symptoms of local recurrence. And uh, you always want to update your family history. And the reason being, for example, I just had a patient who was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer in her 60s. So that's not an indication itself for a genetic referral, but then you know, a few months down the line, her sister developed breast cancer. Now, that's a triple negative breast cancer with a family member with another breast cancer. That would qualify for genetic testing. So I think it's important to keep updating their family history, and that would be important for their, like, sisters and their kids in the future uh, if they turn out to be BRCA positive. You always want to do a thorough examination of the chest wall, the breast, and the axilla, um, uh, question them about the adverse effects uh, of the treatments, especially the endocrine therapies. That they do cause a lot of uh, side effects. You know, there many women complain of fatigue. They complain of mood swings. With the AIs, there's a lot of musculoskeletal symptoms. Um, you know, uh, so it's always important to ask them about these side effects. And women who are on tamoxifen, they need an annual gynecological examination because of the increased risk of uterine cancer. And you want to examine them uh, for any development of lymphedema. Patient who, patients who undergo axillary lymph node dissection and who um, get radiation to the axilla are at pretty high risk for lymphedema. And you want to catch this early and refer them to lymphedema clinics where there's special therapists who help them with exercises and who can fit them with the sleeve and um, help decrease because there's a lot of morbidity which comes with uh, these breast surgeries and lymphedema. Uh, as far as imaging goes, the only imaging that is recommended is an annual mammogram and a DEXA scan every two years for patients who are on AIs. And education, I think, is key. It's important for patients uh, uh, to talk to them about breast awareness, and you don't know how many patients are not adherent to their medications, especially the AIs. And, you know, they wouldn't mention unless you ask. Um, survivorship, I think, is a very important concept, and we've actually recently opened a survivorship clinic at the Brown. Um, so age-appropriate screening is a part of it, assessment and management of long-term physical and psychosocial issues, um, body image concerns. Um, many women uh, say they've had a mastectomy. You know, body image, um, the, the distortion of the body image is a big concern, and they won't be, um, uh, it, it's important to question them about that and then refer them to, um, for uh, breast prosthesis or wigs or whatever it takes to make, you know, make them feel better. Again, lymphedema, cardiotoxicity, the anthracyclines and uh, uh, Herceptin are big ones. You want to keep that in mind. Patients who are treated with those agents are at risk for cardiotoxicity. And if they present with any symptoms, um, cardiac-related like fatigue or CHF symptoms, uh, be suspicious of that. Cognitive impairment uh, could be because of reversible or reversible causes, and you really want to dig into that. Uh, distress, depression, and anxiety management. Fatigue, um, you know, many patients who are on AIs and on tamoxifen complain of fatigue, but, you know, uh, there are many reversible causes of fatigue. You really want to look for those, and you just don't want to chalk it all up to the treatment they're on. Like, um, look for thyroid dysfunction, anemia, or cardiotoxicity, you know, is an important thing. If someone has CHF, they, their only presentation could be fatigue sometimes. And bone health is another thing, which I think we talked about, the DEXA scan and the bisphosphonates. So... I think survivorship is real important, and, and you're probably going to deal with this a lot. So that's all I have for you, and thank you. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. What's the general timeline of lymphedema post-op? Do you ever see it higher or earlier? It's usually, it's usually in like the first one or two months that people start to develop the lymphedema, and it's usually going to be there for a long time.